Thanks for sticking around for the last session of the last day, everyone. It's, I know it's been kind of a long week. Um, yeah, so I'm Will Barnes. I'm a grad student in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at Rice University down in Houston, so just down the road. Um, and I'm going to be talking today about Chianti Pi, which is a Python package for astrophysical spectroscopy and also a, an interface to the Chianti Atomic Database, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, so um, I first want to thank the program committee for giving me a, ch a chance to give this talk and then also for the donors, to the donors for their financial support, um, which allowed me to attend. Um, so Chianti Pi was written by my co-author here, Ken Deere, who is at, uh, is a research professor at George Mason University in Virginia. Um, and, and so I'm just going to talk um, sort of a little bit about the, the database kind of give you an overview of the library and some challenges we've had in the sort of development side of things, um, and also some of the, the capabilities of the database and the motivation behind it as well. Um, so just really quick, here's my contact info, GitHub, Twitter, uh, my blog, um, and email. Um, and then also the URL, if you go to the URL at the bottom of the page, um, that um, it's where all the slides will be, so you can follow along. Um, and they should be the same version if Travis has built them correctly, so. Um, all right. Yeah, so I am in solar physics, and in solar physics we are fortunate that we have a lot of data, and we don't just have a lot of data, but we have a lot of really great uh, high resolution data. Um, and so that means uh, high spatial resolution, temporal resolution, and spectral resolution. Um, so this is a, an image from the Atmospheric Imaging Assembly on the Solar Dynamics Observatory in the 211 angstrom band. So it's a narrow band imager. And so what, um, and it just sits and stares at the sun, the, you know, so you have a full disk view all day, every day, and the data is all completely open. So it's, it's really great. Um, um, and so I'm just going to show off a couple of really nice pictures because that's what you can do if you're in astronomy and solar physics. And so here is a picture from Iris. This is an off-limb sort of uh, picture of some nice solar spicules. And so Iris images the transition region, which is sort of the interface between sort of the lower, cooler part of the sun's atmosphere and sort of the upper part, uh, the much hotter uh, corona. Um, and it's a spectrometer, so it's looking at sort of much uh, higher spectral coverage than sort of something like a narrowband imager would. And then here is an image from um, the ICE instrument on Hinode. It's also a spectrometer. Um, and it has a little bit lower spatial resolution, but it's still re really great spectral coverage. And so what we're looking at right here is, is an active region. Um, and so, okay, we have all this great solar data. We, have, we can make all these really nice pictures. But you know, we, want, we want to do actual science with it. We want to learn something about the plasma on the sun to try to understand sort of the thermodynamics um, of the plasma in the corona. So how do we do that? We want to know, you know what, what are these observations actually telling us? So the tool that solar physicists use, have used for some 20 odd years now uh, is this atomic database called Chianti. So their tagline is an atomic database for diagnostics of astrophysical plasmas. And what it's really focused on is high temperature, low density, optically thin plasmas, uh, mostly in the extreme ultraviolet um, and X-ray. So I should point out, this is mostly, it's most heavily used by the solar physics community, but also by the astrophysics community as well. Um, and so this is a collaboration between George Mason University, the University of Michigan, and the University of Cambridge, as well as many other contributors, contributors and sort of people who started at these places have moved on to, to other places as well. So it's really a um, sort of a, a collaboration between a lot of institutions as, and, and also a lot of several different countries as well. So the Chianti Atomic Database contains um, sort of about 30, 30 ions and then all, or sorry, 30 different elements and all of the and all of the associated ions for those elements as well. So this is sort of the the Chianti periodic table, if you will, and it's, you can see the charge state is on the x-axis and the sort of element is on the y-axis, and the colors and the numbers in these squares correspond to the number of energy levels that there are information about in the Chianti Atomic Database. So you can see kind of the white squares, there's maybe only about five energy levels available for some of these ions, but for, if you, if you look at, um, in particular, iron nine or iron 11, you have like 900 energy levels. Um, and then for each of those, there's also, 
there can be um, you know, hundreds of thousands of atomic transitions available to the, for those as well. So this is a lot of data, and it's currently stored in, unfortunately, a collection of ASCII text files, which is not the best format for a database, but you know, we'll, we'll forget about that for now. And it's about 1.7 gigabytes. Um, <coughs> and so this is very useful for uh, sort of calculating optically thin emission and intensity and being able to learn something about these um, astrophysical or solar plasmas that we're observing. Um, and this has been compiled primarily for the analysis of solar spectra, but again, it can be useful to astrophysicists as well. All right, so it's just some brief history of this project. So it started around sort of the early 1990s, you know, atomic physicists and uh, solar observers um, sort of came together and realized that they needed a consolidated database um, for these, you know, kind of complicated atomic data. And so they were sort of, you know, tables, you, if you think back to sort of like it's early astrophysical papers, there's, you know, pages and pages of tables that people used to read, you know, before computers were as ubiquitous as they are today. Um, and so their goal was to sort of consolidate all of this um, into sort of a single place and then make it also publicly available. So, um, and then make the code used to analyze this data also publicly available. So their goals, you know, even in the 1990s were not so different from a lot of our goals today. Um, and so this is a picture of uh, several of these people, um, in particular um, my co-author, Ken Deer, who is not only the author of Chiantify, but also the, one of the some main contributors and creators of the database from the beginning. Um, and also, you'll notice um, <coughs> Helen Mason on the, on the right-hand side, her and Ken were some of the, so the first people to come up with um, this idea. Um, and so a lot of people ask about, you know, why, why Chianti, why, why the name Chianti? So Chianti is not a, an acronym, despite it being capitalized. Um, it's, they apparently had a bunch of, you know, I, obviously, I was not working on this, you know, when this picture was taken, when they started, I was like six years old or something. So, so when they started working on this, um, they had, I guess, several meetings in, in Tuscany, and they had a collaboration originally with um, uh, a professor named Brunella Monsignori Fossi, who worked on an early spectral code that was sort of the predecessor to Chianti. And unfortunately, she passed away before they were able to publish the, sort of the first version of the database. So the Chianti name is partially um, a tribute to their early meetings in Tuscany and also to her and the work she did that brought about this. Um, okay, so let's flip back to this timeline. So, okay, the early 90s, they started doing some work con consolidating these databases. It was released, the first version was released in 1996. Um, along with the IDL code, so any of us, any astronomers in here know about the, the joys of working with IDL and how much fun it can be. Um, and then around 2003, Ken um, began working on Chianti Pi, mostly just experimenting with how to import data, the Chianti data, um, with Python and how to play around with Python. And I, I recently discussed this with him over email, and he said he was using actually NumArray at the time, which was, I guess, the predecessor to NumPy. Um, so this is very early days of scientific Python. Um, and then around 2009, he put, um, he had version 1.0 of, or 0 0.1, sorry, released uh, of CanityPy re released on SourceForge, which, okay, maybe not the most optimal way to release code, but in 2009, I mean, that was, you know, there weren't very many options. Um, and then finally in 2016, it was moved to GitHub, and that's about the time I got involved with this project, and just in this past, February, we had uh, version 0 0.7 release um, from GitHub, which is exciting. Okay, um, and I'll, I'll just mention too that, so Helen Mason, the person on the right, um, is actually the advisor of my PhD supervisor at Rice currently. So my, my involvement with the project maybe is not so coincidental. All right, so what is Chianti Pi? So I, I guess I already covered some of this, but it's an, an interface, in addition to being a package for spectroscopy, it's an interface to this Chianti database. Um, it can perform a lot of different calculations, including line emission, sort of continuum emission, ionization equilibrium, um, and then compile spectra um, across multiple ions um, and elements and continuum emission. And it also does uh, radi lo radiative loss curves, which I haven't included here. Um, most importantly, it's not a direct translation of the IDL code. So it can, you know, first set out to, to build Chianti Pi. Um, he said his goal was not to, you know, take advantages of the 
the, uh, all the features that Python offers and not just you know, write IDL in Python, um, which I think most of us can probably sympathize with. Um, the goal is also to, in developing in Python and moving to GitHub is to move from just a freely available, you know, not just sort of code available as a tarball on someone's website, but to a truly open source model where all the development is done in the public, you know, you have automatic tests, automatic documentation, all these things that we've come to know and love as part of um, open source. And then of course we can also leverage the full power of Python and the scientific Python stack. Um, so just a couple quick notes about our sort of development infrastructure. We're currently on version 0 0.7, maybe 0 0.71, 0 0.7.1 coming soon. Our release schedule is um, non-existent, basically. Um, we're licensed under the ISC software license. Uh, again, all development is done on GitHub. We have about 17 open issues, uh, zero to one PRs per week. It's a pretty small project. Ken and I are the main contributors, and by main, I mean only, um, with a few other people kind of coming in and out. Um, Though we have had about 100 merge pull requests in the past year, most of those are ma the master branch is broken, we should probably fix it. Uh, so we do automatic builds on Travis, which is nice. Um, we support Python 2.7, 3.4, 3.5, maybe 3.6 soon-ish, I don't know. Uh, we have a minimal test suite, and if you notice our coveralls badge up there, it's pretty low, um, but that's okay. Uh, and again, we do automatic documentation builds. Um, and then a lot, I should mention, a lot of our testing and docs infrastructures has been um, <laughs> kindly provided by the AstroPy folks. They have a lot of really nice packages for helping sort of smaller affiliated packages get off the ground. And so we owe a lot of, a lot of that infrastructure help to them. So we're also part of the Open Astronomy Collaboration, which involves sort of the SunPy, AstroPy, and YT folks. Um, and that, so that's mainly a collaboration for things like Google Summer of Code and so the Python and astronomy workshops. Um, so I think you can go to openastronomy.org and, and find more out about that. Okay, so how do you go and install it? Maybe some people are interested in this. Um, I would recommend just going to GitHub, cloning it, Python, set up py, to install. That's the easiest way. It is on uh, PyPI, but I don't know when that version was last updated, so it's better to just stick with GitHub. Um, we're, we'd like to release on Conda Forge, um, but currently I'm not sure how to make the database a dependency on Conda Forge. So maybe that's something I need to talk to if there's any Conda Forge people um, in the room I'd be interested, or people that have solved this problem before, I'd be interested to, to talk to you. Okay, so let's get into sort of the meat of, of the package. Let's discuss a few of the objects. So the, the primary, primary building block of the database is, is an ion. So you can sort of see the file tree on the right side there. Um, so we have you know, all of our elements, and then for each element we have all the ions. And then for each ion you have a couple pieces of information. So these, these file extensions don't really mean anything to you probably, but the, there's sort of the energy levels of these E L B L C whatever this this is from the database, so these energy level files they have the yeah, atomic transition files, um, and so the main thing we're interested in is doing line is calculating the line emission um, from primarily from collisions between these ions and these free electrons, and so all this is all sort of based in this ion object, um, so you can see this little code snippet that shows how to instantiate an ion object. You give it an array of temperature and density. And then um, in, in addition to uh, a couple of the methods that I'll talk about in a minute, it also exposes um, the data associated with that um, ion in the database uh, as attributes. Oh, okay, my math jack is not rendering on my screen, but I'm glad it's rendering here. <laughs> Good, okay. Um, so the, the primary thing that we care about is again calculating the intensity. So. In this expression at the top, the only thing really that you need to, that we're going to talk about for the most part is this n sub j, and that's the level population. That just tells how populated a particular energy, particular energy level is as a function of temperature and density. And you solve it using sort of this equation at the bottom. And if you sort of squint, you can probably see that this involves doing a matrix inversion. And unfortunately, the dimensions of the matrix are uh, it's a square matrix with the dimensions being the number of energy levels. So for some, in the case where we have like 900 energy levels, this becomes kind of a pain. Um, 
and we'll just sort of uh, and yeah. So the 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 sources um, for these the populations are sort of the collisional excitation from the lower levels and the radiative decay to the upper levels and then the sinks vice versa. And so all this data, this collisional excitations and the radiative decays are pulled in from Chianti, the, the actual database. Okay, so this this calculation is is kind of complicated, but the Chianti Pi makes it um, relatively straightforward to do. You just call the populate method on on this ion object, and it and it um, creates an attribute called populate, but capitalized. Um, and then and then so that that that's where the 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 answer from the calculation lives, and that allows you to sort of cache the answer so you don't, at later times, if you need it again, you don't have to repeat the calculation. Um, and then Ken has also written a couple of these nice little um, convenience functions for plotting these things. Um, and so this is just an example that shows sort of the top 50 um, energy levels plotted as a function of, of temperature. And then similarly, you can, you can calculate the spectrum for a particular um, wavelength range. And so this just shows the, it's actually the, the intensity expression that I showed before and con convolved with a, a Lorentzian filter. Um, and again, there's sort of similar methods um, for both calculating this and then sort of easy methods for doing sort of a quick look at the plot. Okay, so in addition to line emission, we also can calculate continuum emission. This is uh, free free or Bremstrong, as well as free bound, free free bound emission. And so, if you sort of just look look up the expression, you can see that most of those things are constants or inputs. Um, all, all the stuff in parentheses is mostly constants, and the lambda and temperature are inputs. But the tricky thing to calculate is this Gaunt factor, and Chianti Pi has a couple of capabilities for using sort of known techniques in the literature for, for calculating, calculating that, that quantity. Um, uh, similarly, in this free bound calculation, you know, most of this is you know, the phot photon energy, which is, again, just a function of wavelength, or the temperature. Um, but this, this, this omega i and omega o and this are, are the statistical weights of the levels. Thanks. And then the sigma i is the cross section. And again, it's a similar situation as the Gaunt factor. It's sort of tricky to calculate. Um, but we provide some sort of nice ways of, um, uh, of approximating that quantity um, using techniques from, from various papers. And so we can, you know, it's a similar API, we can call the, we can create a continuum object. So this is different from sort of the ion object since these are um, sort of different types of emission. Um, and then we can call a calculate free free emission or calculate free bound emission and give it a wavelength. And then it will return, it actually returns a 2D array. So as a function of temperature and wavelength for both the free free and the free bound emission. And again, these are stored as, as attributes, which is why I'm not, I'm not returning um, the calculation to anything because these are stored as attributes. So lastly, we can do something similar with the ionization equilibrium. So this is a much simpler, this is sort of similar to the level populations, but a much, uh, much simpler calculation where we can calculate the charge state as a function of temperature. Um, and this just involves the recombination and ionization rates, again, read from the Chianti database. Um, and you, this, with this equation, as long as you have a sort of a starting value, you can just solve this iter iteratively. And so the interface to that in Chianti Pi looks something like this. And so you can either load, Chianti Pi actually um, has a couple of, of data sets of ionization equilibrium already stored in it, or you can sort of recalculate them based on a temperature array that you've chosen. And so you can see sort of that's, this is what this plot shows. The, the dashed lines are the sort of l data loaded in and then the solid lines. And so this is for every iron ion. Sorry, I should have uh, specified that. Um, and so for the, and then the solid lines are the ones that, that I've calculated. Okay, so this is all, all great, but ha, you know, how is this useful? So I'll just go through just two quick applications. So one of the things that this, that Chianti database has been really useful for is, again, interpreting observations. Um, and in particular, the sort of AIA instrument, the, the observation that I showed first, um, you need to build up, um, to, to understand what temperatures you're seeing and which passband, you need to understand what lines are emitting in that passband. And so this plot on the left shows um, sort of the ion, 
uh, iron 12 and iron 13, um, the locations of those spectral lines superimposed on, on the 211 angstrom passband from AIA. And on the right um, is the resulting temperature. So this is just, the, the plot on the left is more or less just a schematic to show what, what lines fall in this passband. And the plot on the right shows the temperature response function. And to do this, currently, um, so this is done in Python, but currently in the, the way most solar physicists interact with this is using IDL. And so IDL uses the Chianti data and so our, one of our goals has been to, to implement this in SunPy, which is a Python package for solar data analysis. And so you can see at the top is a pull request that was originally opened by a Summer of Code student working with myself and Drew Leonard at the University of Sheffield. Um, she opened this in like May of 2016, which has been a while now. And then I adopted it in September after she finished up with her internship. And unfortunately, it's still not been merged because there are a lot of challenges, it turns out, with making Chianti a package and then making it a dependency of SunPy. And, but hopefully, in the near future, people will be able to go in and, and use this to, to calculate these AA response functions, which is of really great importance in the field of solar physics, um, using Chianti Pi and SunPy rather than having to go to the IDL routines. So now I just want to show off something from my research. So I do sort of sim simulations of coronal loops, and in particular, forward modeling of active regions. So what you're seeing here, there's a lot of details. But what, what we've done is take a 3D grid of temperature and density. Thanks. And we've for each point in the grid, we've calculated the iron-12 emission, uh, iron-12-195 angstrom emission using um, Chianti and Chianti Pi. And then we've projected it down along the line of sight and convolved it with the instrument response of the ICE instrument, um, and um, as well with the point spread function, in order to synthesize what the Hinode ICE detector would see. And then we've done this for a, you know a, for a whole simulation, so at a series of time steps. So what you're seeing is the uh, resulting iron 12 from uh, coronal loops heated um, by impulsive um, nano flares. Um, and so I think this is a really nice visualization of how this, this Chianti data can be used for not only observations, but also on the modeling side. All right, so just to finish up, um, there's a couple of resources. We're on GitHub. We have Read the Docs. There's the Chianti um, Web page, which has a lot of good information about the database. There's also a mailing list, which serves for, as both mailing list for the, the database, the IDL code, and the Python code. Um, and then we also wrote a proceedings paper. So if you want, you know, the, the sort of the gory details about uh, about the package, um, go visit that. And I, I should have mentioned too that the the Chianti uh, database team has published. Um, about 15 papers. They published a paper for each version of the database they put out, and that in, the entire list of those publications um, is in the proceedings paper as well. All right, so I just need to acknowledge sort of the Chianti team. Obviously, this would, talk would not have been possible if they had not created the database, um, particular Helen Mason and Julio, De, Julio Delzana at Cambridge, um, my co-author Kinder, um, Peter Young at Goddard Space Flight Center, and then many more people have worked on it. Um, the SunPy project, they provide a lot of good sort of advice for us as we've been sort of build, building up our infrastructure for the package, in particular Stu Mumford and David Perez Suarez, um, and then the AstroPy project for all the great tools that they've provided um, for us. And then lastly, my advisor, Stephen Bradshaw at Rice, for giving me the time and the freedom to work on these kinds of things. So thank you very much. Yes. So yes. What sort of solvers? I think for the so for the 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 one that I mentioned for the level populations, we're just using the I think the Linel Linel solve one for doing just or maybe it's the or we're doing some matrix inversion. But yeah, it's SciPy and NumPy for all for all of that stuff. Yeah. Well, there, I saw some ODEs in there too. Did you have a integration of that? Um, I don't think so. I don't. Yeah, I don't think so. I think it's mainly sort of. Just solving large systems of equations is, yeah, that's our main challenge. Yeah. Are you getting credit for this in the broader economical community? 
Um, <laughs> what do you mean by credit? <laughs> Uh, that's a good question, and I hope so. I mean, I, I'm still, <laughs> I'm still a fourth year. I, I, I've just finished my fourth year of grad school, so I probably got a couple more to go. So I hope so. Um, but I, yeah, it's there's not a lot of money in software development and science, as you probably know. So uh, I mean, credit in that people realize that we're working on these things, and I and I think it's slowly the Python sort of ecosystem is slowly being appreciated in solar physics. So, okay, how do I say this? Uh, <laughs> so I am by far the youngest member of this. I'm not even really part of, formally part of the Chianti team. So they, I mean, they've made all these decisions sort of way back a long time ago, and, I'm, and they had you know, great reasons for doing them then. And it's just, I, I think, again, it's a matter of manpower and momentum. And they do things the way they did before because that's the easiest and it you know, takes the least amount of time to do. And so, I, th I, th I think it could be, several people have actually asked us whether it could be ported to like HDF5, and yes, it can, because I've done it, um, and, it and it's very easy, and I, I think we're talking a bit about maybe trying to distribute the database as an HDF5 file, maybe as a companion to the sort of ASCII text files. Does it get updated a lot? Is it something that's continuous? Yes, it is, yeah, so there, like yeah, so, so Julio and, and Helen and but well, all these people that have listened to the Chianti team are actively working on, as well as others, are actively sort of developing Chianti. It, you know, it's again, it's a question of funding, but yes, it is continually being updated. I I think someone has done that. I'm not sure, but yeah, I mean, it's if you wanted a different format, it's just a matter of writing a script to build it into a different format, I guess. Yeah, but Sure, yeah. <laughs> but that's something we're working on. Um, it's a question I've raised, yeah. All right, well, let's thank Will again.